All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, yes, yeah, my pleasure to uh, to be the moderator for this discussion. And uh, uh, what we want to get at here, I think, is uh, in keeping with the theme of materials by design, uh, bring together some uh, real uh, industry experts who uh, deal with materials uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in various contexts, and uh, and sort of let us know uh, how. Uh, materials by design really plays out uh, in in that context. So we have, I think, a great uh, group of people to help us do that, um, who represent companies uh, from different parts of the uh, technology and materials innovation uh, ecosystem. So I'll begin uh, by uh, introducing. I'll go in order here uh, from. Um, your left to uh, to your right in the audience, um, uh, Nag Padablanda of Applied Materials uh, is uh, Managing Director of Technology, External and Government Programs uh, at AMAT. And he has very wide ranging responsibilities uh, over uh, many different uh, aspects of Applied Materials uh, business. Uh, but I want to highlight in particular managing uh, 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 innovation partnerships, uh, product strategy and alignment uh, uh, with industry roadmaps. Uh, he also leads uh, programs uh, more specifically uh, to develop tools for manufacturing things like gallium nitride LEDs and smart grid technologies, which are very interesting in the context of energy and the environment. Uh, before be, uh, coming to Applied, uh, Nag was director of the Center for Future Energy Systems at Rensselaer Polytechnic uh, Institute in New York State. Uh, and uh, he received his PhD in material science um, from Rutgers has authored 40 publications and uh, patents in various areas of material science. Thank Welcome. You. Uh, also, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce uh, Homer Antoniadis, uh, who's the Global Technology Director at DuPont Photovoltaic Solutions. Um, Homer joined DuPont in 2011 uh, following its uh, acquisition of Innovalite, uh, a, a startup company uh, where he was CTO and Vice President of Engineering. And uh, uh, Homer has a 20-year industrial career um, that uh, includes positions at places like HP Labs and Xerox, uh, in addition to his experience at smaller companies and now back again in a big one in DuPont. Um, he uh, has a PhD in physics from Syracuse University and uh, 25 issued US patents and uh, 60 scientific publications related to uh, silicon um, photovoltaics. Welcome, Homer. And then finally, uh, Lorenza Moro uh, leads a group at Sam Samsung Chael, uh, working on um, barrier technology and encapsulation for display and flexible electronics technologies. Um, Lorenza has held uh, several different positions in industry uh, with uh, SRI International, for example, also Vitex Systems, which was a spin-off of the B uh, Battelle Memorial Institute, and also uh, at uh, uh, public research centers in her native Italy, uh, where she was involved in collaborative research projects with major European corporations. Uh, uh, Lorenza has a PhD in physics from uh, University of Padova and uh, has published more than 80 uh, research papers in refereed journals and conference proceedings and holds a number of patents related to uh, new materials, processes, and applications. Thank you Thank for you. your attendance and, and your participation, Lorenza. So I think uh, the uh, the format we would like to have for the panel discussion, we've asked uh, each of the um, panelists to prepare some remarks, um, sort of six to eight minutes or so per panelist, uh, and uh, sort of give their, uh, their, their vision uh, as it's related to our, um, our conference here today. And then um, we'll, uh, we'll have a question and answer period for the remaining um, 30 or so minutes, uh, including questions from the audience, and uh, try to keep things informal. So uh, with that, um, I, uh, let's see, I guess uh, maybe we should just go in this order, if that's all right. If you'd like to go, Nag. Uh. Yeah, I can. <clears throat> Do you have, have a pointer? Or? Yeah. yeah, OK, great. Oh, great. And there's also great. a pointer built into that. Oh, OK. Uh, I'll use Do that. you have these teed up in a particular order, Richard? Yeah. Easily oh, change, okay. or do you want to stick with that? So you want to go first, Homer? Okay. Yeah, okay. We'll let him go yeah. first. Okay, yeah, here we go. All first. right, we'll go, with, we'll go with Homer yeah. first. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here, and Steve, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present here. Um, I wanted to share with you a few words about um, uh, photovoltaic materials. Uh, within DuPont, but before I do that, I wanted to introduce you to DuPont. Some of you may not know what uh, 
uh, DuPont does. As you know, it's one of the biggest, the largest uh, chemical companies around the world. And what you can see here in this uh, picture, it, it captures the products that, that DuPont is, uh, is making available, uh, are capturing this very broad um, sector all the way from, uh, from um, agriculture to food to bioscience, and of course all the uh, more traditional materials from automotive to uh, mobile displays and large displays, solar energy, of course, and I will be talking to you a little bit more about that today, and of course protection, you know everything about Kevlar and, and Tyvek. But what I wanted to do today is to share a little bit more uh, with you about the materials that um, built the module, the crystal silicon module that most of us are using uh, for converting light to electricity. This is the untold story that we share with the rest of the world that actually the materials make the module. And what we show there is a cross section. Let me see how can I get the pointer to work. Um, uh, there you go, that's right. So you see the cross section of the crystal silicon uh, traditional wafer that it's sandwiched between a piece of glass and a material in the back that is made by. Uh, DuPont, this is the Tedlar uh, film that you see there, but also you need conductors to collect the electricity. And this is done usually with silver paste that we call solomet, this is the metallization paste. And finally, you need to encapsulate the cells in a way of protecting them from humidity, etc. And these are the encapsulants, right? Uh, films that you use to pretty much uh, sandwich the crystalline silicon cells between two different encapsulants. So what I would like to do today is talk to you a little bit more about the fundamentals of the solar cell technology and I will uh, focus more into the metallization. So to judge a material system, when you design the material system for solar cells and to judge it if it is good or bad for photovoltaics, you need to ask three questions. How reliable the material is over the course of many years of operation? Uh, how efficient is the module that you're making with this type of material? And finally, the cost of fabrication. So when we design materials, pretty much we wanna make sure that all these three pillars of photovoltaics are met, right? So the most important, of course, is the lifetime. You wanna make sure that the panels last for 30 years up in your roof. I will talk a little bit more about the roadmap of what do we do to improve the efficiency, what we have done in the past and where we're going in the future. And of course, we have materials that deliver affordability and ease of installation. But I would like to focus more on the efficiency today and talk about the metallization. Talk about the silver paste that goes on the front and the back of the cells as a way of collecting the electricity, but also the the intricate properties of these materials in contacting the very front surface. So what you see here is the roadmap all the way from 2005 until now, where we're plotting the efficiency of the crystalline silicon cell as a function of the time of development with referencing different products, metallization products that basically enable efficiencies to go all the way from, if I go a little bit earlier, from 15% now to 19%. And we're developing um, metallization materials that will extract even more electricity. And of course, this metal paste that we have developed over the years is an affordable material that you screen print. And it has a lot of interesting properties that allow you to extract the maximum possible current out. We have been quite successful in the industry. As a matter of fact, the majority of uh, the manufacturers are using materials of that sort. In the past two years, we have managed to improve the efficiency for the same manufacturing line. We have managed to improve the efficiency by 10 or 20 percent, which is huge in terms of profitability and in terms of making the manufacturing of the cells um, affordable to the rest of the world. What we have managed to do is to come up with a series of formulations that allow you to build very good contacts from the metal to the emitter on the PN junction. Five years ago, this junction was very resistive. So by developing the right materials, 
we have managed to make this juncture uh, less resistive, thus extracting more uh, current out for the same uh, illumination. And we've done this thing very successfully in a way that the industry prefers to stay in this type of architecture because they're extracting from the same investment pretty much more power. But as I said before, there are more, more architectures that come in the future that will enable us, enable us to uh, deliver even more power. And with that, I would like to conclude, as we discuss here, I would like to delve a little bit uh, more into the details of how we have done this and how we have enabled uh, with materials design to get the maximum power output out of a given investment manufacturing uh, line. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Homer. So um, we'll proceed now with a presentation by Lorenza, and then we'll, uh, we'll have a Q&A for all three panelists uh, after the presentations. Okay, again, uh, thank you for inviting uh, uh, us uh, to present uh, our company. And uh, uh, the name of the company is actually Chill Industry, and we are uh, part of uh, the um, of the Samsung Group. And actually, more in particular, we are the mother of the Samsung Group that was funded actually out of the money of uh, 94. So uh, as a month ago, this was the, there were four uh, divisions inside this specific part of uh, Samsung that deal with material. But the companies are a, a reality that keep evolving. And so uh, by the end of the year, the textile, the original part, uh, will uh, become an independent company. The effort of a chain industry that possibly will also change the name <laughs> will be on chemical and electronic material. And that will be reinforced by the acquisition of a few uh, weeks ago by, of Novaled, that is a German company that has uh, developed uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, electronic material for uh, OLED. So uh, the company uh, is a Korean company, but uh, does R&D mainly in Korea, but also outside uh, uh, the Korean uh, peninsula. And there are uh, at this moment uh, four, uh, three uh, at this moment, Yokohama, San Jose, and Frankfurt Research Center. And uh, at, uh, uh, there is the Dresden that with the acquisition of Novaland. But uh, the company uh, is uh, a seven billion dollars uh, uh, company in revenue, 5,200 uh, 5, employees as 2012, and uh, a large number uh, employed in R&D with 700 units. The, um, the major uh, product uh, are uh, in chemicals uh, are uh, uh, polycarbonates and uh, styrenic uh, um, uh, plastics. And uh, together with the traditional uh, um, uh, application, the new thrust where a lot of R&D is involved is in uh, modify the functionality of the existing resins to become applied in new fields that are efficient in the energy world. A specific field is the polycarbonates in application in automotive to make the cars lights in more efficient. Another line of strong R&D is to make the material eco-friendly. Uh, the, another large part uh, is uh, what is uh, uh, of a chain uh, is uh, the production of electronic material and those range uh, from the traditional semiconductor to the display for the material for traditional display and a big effort that will be become even bigger in OLED to make a flexible display and that is where my group and I uh, actually focus on some of our activity. There is another branch that is uh, on energy and environment, and they have and the production there is uh, the production and then R and D is uh, uh, for photovoltaic cell, secondary battery, 
LED uh, for illumination, efficient illumination and water membrane for water treatments. So um, they, um, we were asked uh, to uh, put out some ideas on how, how inside the company the innovation is uh, done. And uh, the, there is a lot, as I said, uh, uh, Chail invest uh, very notable in R&D, uh, typically around the 4% of the revenue. Most of their R&D, as I mentioned before, is done uh, in Korea, both uh, internal R&D as well as external R&D uh, 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 collaboration with university and institution. Uh, in Korea and more so abroad, there is a very strong effort, and this is not just the chain, but of the Samsung Group in open innovation. And so the open innovation acquire uh, two aspects. One is engagement with the university and R&D center. Uh, that are uh, top level. I was told today that uh, uh, there are 18 active uh, con uh, contract uh, collaboration with Stanford University. It, this is not Chale, it's the Samsung Group. And, uh, and also with other company where there is engagement uh, on specific topic and for R&D startup uh, there is many time uh, there is investment acquisition I am in sale as a, a consequence of that. And the important aspect is that the Open Innovation Group in the Bay Area has some coordination at the group level, not just on the company level. So uh, the topic of today was uh, the uh, how modeling and material by design are relevant in the industry. And so in uh, uh, CHAIL, uh, definitely the modeling and the, the simulation effort are basic to the introduction of any new material and new project. And this uh, uh, involved uh, uh, both the, the bulk material, the, uh, the resins, as well as the most specific electronic material here. I, uh, I put just two examples from the OLED and from the uh, bulk material and uh, I put a reference and mainly uh, the reason why I put the reference was that the level of mod uh, modeling is not just uh, utilitaristic but it is done at a relevant scientific um, level. Uh, I want to, to conclude this uh, uh, commenting on uh, uh, mo how modeling impact the, uh, the, the real life when you work in development of material and I choose to do it uh, to avoid any problem with material uh, taken by for past experience and the uh, old published material. And so this uh, is an example of why how in Vitex uh, uh, we study addition of this uh, multi-layer barrier. And uh, here the idea is actually what uh, uh, something related to uh, what uh, uh, Ryan uh, was talking this morning, the, uh, the addition uh, loss that you might have during the, um, the, the function of the barrier itself and how you need to uh, model. And in this particular example that we did uh, in, in the context of a European contract, uh, what happened was that we actually failed. We used mat modeling and we failed to get the property that we want. And why? Why? Because the, what was missing and sometimes is missing in many fields of application of modeling, it was the the, uh, the knowledge of the basic property of the material. If Reinhold at the time, this is the work of 2003, had already had his tool to measure the elastic property of very soft material, this would have been a successful example of modeling. The other 
uh, example that I want to give is coming from Honeywell Electronic Materials, and uh, uh, again, ironically, is related to something that Rhino presented. And this is, uh, again, his published work is uh, at the time uh, with uh, Brian Bedwell that is here also, we were developing uh, low-K uh, dielectric uh, for uh, spin-on dielectrics. And the big problem was uh, how to reduce the K as well as maintaining the mechanical property of the materials. And so you can't go in the lab and uh, try uh, all the formulation. And so with Nancy uh, Yamamoto, that was the model at uh, Honeywell, one of the models at Honeywell, she did for us uh, all the simulation to uh, using uh, molecular dynamics and the changing both the uh, porosity as well as the functional group in the molecules. And we were successful, and we were successful to identify the, the area where we had to play in uh, porosity and uh, the, in chemistry. I'm a physicist, so I am completely outside the chemistry. That was <laughs> so, uh, the limit. So this was a, a successful example. But then uh, the effort to, to carry on this, uh, to model uh, the adhesion and other property, again fail. And in this case, uh, the limitation was actually on the computational power that at the time, maybe now is more, you have a very, but uh, I talked with Nancy, I called Nancy actually in preparation, still uh, the computational power uh, power that in an industry you have is not often enough to uh, carry on a mi meaningful simulation, especially when from a molecular level you want to go to a larger scale that you need to, sim to go to adhesion or other properties. And here I close uh, and uh, I just wanted to, to give my opinion of where. One other addition before I close is that the, the, a key point to have material by design be successful is the collaboration between the experimental people in the lab and the modelers. Because many times the small details that the experimental people do in the lab have actually a very fundamental importance that if they are not feedback to the modeling, really make the two words uh, uh, incommunicado. <laughs> uh, and, and so. okay. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. All right. Nog, please. Okay. Uh, again, my name is Nag Parimendla from uh, Applied Materials. Um, even though the title says semi-solar and display, so you heard quite a bit uh, about solar and uh, a little bit about display with two LEDs uh, from the other two panelists, so I won't cover much of that. So this is part of a much bigger presentation. I just took a few slides off. Uh, you need to read that. One question that uh, a lot of you asked me today but I can't comment about is uh, applied spending merger, so I, which I won't touch on. Um, so Applied is a semiconductor equipment company. We supply wafer fab equipment to companies like uh, Intel, IBM, Samsung, and TSMC, and so on. Um, so we are about $9 billion company. Our uh, revenues do fluctuate quite a bit, anywhere between 8 to 12, depending on the year, because the capacity add in the semi-fab is very cyclical. Uh, we are a global company, 86 locations, about 13,000 employees, and uh, highly innovative, uh, oriented, uh, and we look for a lot of patents and stuff. Um, so the three areas uh, that Applied offers manufacturing tools in is semiconductor, display, and solar. And in the uh, space of semiconductors, uh, with our commitment to Moore's Law, there was a lot of talk about Moore this morning, so with our commitment to Moore's Law, we were able to reduce the cost per transistor over 30 years by 20 million X. So I don't know how many of you have more than four smartphones in your home. Can I see hands or? 
Uh, so all of you would have been ranked above any of the Waltons in 1976. So it had around $16 billion net worth for your, just your cell phones. So that's, you know, kind of, you know, tongue in cheek kind of a comment. But nevertheless, it's amazing what um, Applied has done in killing the wealth of people. So, <laughs> so we took the same learnings and knowledge applied it to uh, display, and we were able to reduce the cost per area, which is the metric there, in about a period of a decade and a half, by about 20-fold. And similarly, uh, the cost per watt in solar by about five-fold. So um, a lot of the uh, dr driver for uh, semiconductor space, and frankly, in the other two spaces, comes from wanting to do higher functionality and lower cost. So in addition to that, off late in semiconductors, we have additional drivers. So the today's semiconductors are driven by mobility applications. Everybody wants a mobile device, and they want more and more functionality in their mobile device. Two things that come with, with it is continued drive towards lower cost in those mobility devices. In addition to that, a slim form factor. So there is a significant need for a form factor to get thinner and thinner, and lower power usage. So from having two drivers in our approach you know, for our manufacturing, we now have doubled it and we have four different drivers and not always aligned. So that drives a lot of what we do. And this is a chart that we took, uh, we modified slightly from John Kelly, IBM um, um, presenter from uh, one, of our, uh, one of our annual conferences. So if you look at what the materials that were used in semiconductors or ICs in the 1990s was simply four elements. There were other elements that were used in the processing, but nevertheless, the key elements that remained in the semiconductor devices were those six. For example, fluorine was used in most of the etching or plasma etch of the oxides and so on, but it wasn't left in the uh, device. If we move a decade further through 90s and mid 2000s, so there were several other elements that were added. So that, that was complex enough, and that was one of the cost drivers, reductions for our cost reduction, and more manufacturing complexity, and so on. If we go past one more decade, so we are now beginning to fill up the periodic table. So this adds significant complexity to what we do, and day in and day out. And we don't use, we, we rarely use many of them as elements. You know, these are all compounds, mixtures, and non-stachyometric mixtures of various kinds and so on. So it's very important for us to start thinking about how do we actually address various properties of these materials as we start to mix them. Um, and this is not even futuristic. I mean, if you notice carefully, we didn't label carbon, we didn't, we didn't color carbon, we didn't cover gallium arsenide and so on. These are all three, five compounds that people want to put into these devices. You know, so if we start looking at the future, this is going to get more and more complicated. So we have a lot of materials, <clears throat> uh, innovation driving what we do day in and day out. In addition to that, the um, devices are getting complex. So in the uh, transistors, with the advent of 3D devices, the there is an acceleration in the introduction of new and new materials and mixtures. So that is adding significant issue to us. So people want to put in carbon, germanium, and various other things into the active regions of the device. A lot more dopants coming into the um, uh, gate regions. So that is adding a lot more complexity to what we do. In the uh, interconnect, as um, uh, device features are getting thinner and thinner, the copper lines are getting much smaller and thinner you have significant issues with the resistance and capacitance going up. We have to address that. So a lot of people are proposing to use graphene as an interconnect material, but the issue with it is being able to deposit graphene at uh, very low temperatures for graphene and be able to deposit graphene on top of graphene. It's not just good enough to deposit one layer of graphene on copper. So you need multiple layers of it, so you, you add more complexity. Um, so keeping up with the Moore's law, or more than more, we are looking, we are seeing a trend that more and more packaging is getting onto the wafer level. So that is a trend that we are beginning to address, and that adds a lot more complexity to the kind of materials we deal with, both in processing as well as the materials that we can leave behind right under the chip. 
So similarly, patterning, you know, with the UV introduction getting delayed and delayed, there's more and innovative ways for the mask materials and the tolerances that we, we need to maintain there. So that's adding complexity to it. So um, just to show you the kind of inflections the industry went through, the semiconductor industry went through, these were the inflections over the last 15 years. And if those were not bad enough, in the next five years, we expect significantly more number of inflections. So we have to deal with every one of these inflections with new materials, complexity in the design, and uh, keeping the cost low, keeping the form factor thin, and reducing the power usage, and uh, increasing the functionality. So that's making our life a little more complicated. So with that, uh, I just want to close by saying, you know, there is trends in the semiconductor industry as more and more new materials are added many challenges on the ITRS roadmap to the 10 nanometers with the 3D devices and um, materials device and uh, you know these architectures getting blurred. There is increasing pressure on our cost, to, cost of R&D. We spend a significant amount of our money, uh, our revenue on R&D, but because of the compressed cycles and the number of inflections that we are seeing, so there is a significant pressure on our R&D dollars. And in addition to all that, people are beginning to talk about 450 nanometer transition. So that will make it even more complicated, our life. So the opportunities is really precise materials engineering. So we want to be able to do selective deposition, selective, not just selective materials, selective area, selective locations, deposition removal and doping, you know, faster and better, cheaper materials. CombiCam is an area of interest to us and more and more simulation and modeling, including you know, what we want to know is when we actually put the material down in the device, what would it behave like? You know, so um, precision materials engineering is key as we move forward. So thank you. Thank you, Nod. Okay, so uh, I, I, th I thought we could start, I, I have a couple of questions and maybe get things kicked off and then we can go to, uh, to audience questions. Uh, and uh, and see uh, see where we end up. Um, I, I was uh, struck by the uh, uh, discussions by all three speakers um, that uh, um, you know the different ways in which uh, innovation uh, can be done in in different companies that address materials. Uh, so I had I wanted to start with a question, um, sort of going back to maybe the uh, the early post-war period and. Uh, uh, the, the era of big industrial champions, uh, the, um, the the model for in industrial materials innovations uh, often involved um, work in a central research laboratory where you had dedicated scientists who were kind of doing freewheeling uh, uh, research, uh, which often led to big discoveries. I mean, for example, the discovery of the point contact transistor emerged from about 10 years of, of basic materials research on materials that exhibited rectification and uh, it's not clear that it would have ever ended up that way but it did um, uh, it seems like that model for doing materials innovation in industry if it's not dead is at least um, uh, maybe not as uh, uh, prevalent as it once was uh, and there are other ways of doing things so I just wondered from your own perspectives of having you know extensive careers in, in this area and working at uh, important companies how, how do you think how has this played played out? How, is it, how does it work in your company, and what do you, you know? What are the ways in which innovation is really done in a way that can impact industry? So maybe I'll we'll just start alphabetically with Homer. Sure. Yeah. So I can address that. Uh, as far as the point is concerned, uh, we develop materials based on the input of our customers. So we're doing market-driven uh, research. So it's extremely important to understand the product, to understand the needs of the customers, and uh, work with them in an innovative way, in a collaborative way, to help them um, continue uh, to be in business together with us in a win-win uh, scenario. So it's important to understand that system. So in the case of the metallization, uh, it was very important for DuPont early on to understand what it takes to, um, uh, to extract more power out of a given cell. So we had to go into learning how the cell works. So we had to have the discipline to understand how to make the cells, to communicate with the customer, and do um, design the materials in a way that uh, we know where we're going. Mm. So serendipity in this way was somewhat control. Yeah. However, within the central research, we, uh, we do less of that 
and more discovery. Mm -hmm. And uh, the chance of discovering a new material or a new process is a lot higher than the R&D that you do in the division. So we do some of that too, mm -hmm. uh, but it's more in the corporate research rather than the R&D in the division. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and there's good communication between There is always a good communication, and actually the teams are always communicated starting with the discovery to development and then manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Okay, we good. So, um, um, Lorenzo. So, um, I will talk a little more about the electronic material because but we are, in that sense, uh, uh, privileged because uh, uh, actually Samsung, uh, one, many of our customers are actually part of Samsung. Mm. And so uh, the, the integration between what is uh, the, uh, the innovation in material and the driver from the market mm. Uh, is uh, somehow internally is uh, uh, so uh, so both uh, but definitely uh, compared to uh, when I started to to be <coughs> a, a scientist etc. Uh, if uh, uh, we were talking with somebody else, uh, so between uh, the research uh, push and the market pull. Uh, uh, the market pool won the <laughs> the battle, yeah. and so uh, the, that is uh, what it is in industry right now. However, I think that uh, from my point of view, and here I express my own opinion, like in the Bay Area, we are in a kind of special uh, situation where it's like to be in an enormous research campus, <laughs> and in that sense, uh, the the role of Stanford or other university and institution that is very uh, very important because mm. that is what brought to make this area what it is right, right. and so a lot of basic research not basic basic but uh, fundamental research is done also maybe in startups in mm. startups that are the direct uh, product from university yeah. or institutions yeah and I guess in your case and also in Homer's I mean you you're at, at the right. in the jobs you're in now because of that yeah, process yeah, exactly so so just as a sidebar to that um, uh, is there did you notice a big difference in in your own uh, experience going from uh, a, a small company that was acquired by a bigger one so if I have to co uh, so there is a big difference between a small company and a, a bigger company uh, and I saw that uh, I mean going from Honeywell uh, to uh, to Vitex so I did mm. the, the, reverse. The, the reverse now going back to a big company uh, uh, there is that uh, in my case I guess uh, there is the additional <laughs> that uh, uh, complication that uh, I'm dealing now with a company that is a Korean company as opposed as uh, a, an yeah, American sure. company. Yeah, yeah, sure. So from my point of view, in the startup environment, you're dealing with a single talent. You're trying to develop yeah. a single idea, a single product, where in a large corporate environment, uh, you are faced with many different challenges. You have the responsibility to respond to the society, to, the, to your customers, not only with an answer to a single challenge, but multiple challenges so we find ourselves working in multiple activities sure. and of course we have a lot more resources right. yeah. to execute yeah. that so yeah. startups are a lot more focused um, and a lot faster as a result of that where large corporations tend to process things in the parallel process right. with many more uh, topics Very good. and products so so now I mean you're you just showed us how challenging I mean the the job is that applied materials has yeah. you know you've got to make this equipment that makes these exquisite nanometer scale structures while right. integrating all of these new materials every generation. So how do you, how do, you do innovation that, uh, around materials that can make this happen in, in applied materials? So yeah, um, materials is in our name, but uh, you know, for a long time we sold equipment, not materials. <laughs> uh, we are changing it. We, we have a pretty open business model. Uh, we practice open innovation with uh, true and true every day. So that's what uh, each of us remind, our colleagues remind each other. Mm. So we are not very proud people. We, if we see something <laughs> out there that we like, um, we think of it going and adopting it, bringing it in and uh, you know, scaling it up. So we truly believe that it's the innovation, not invention, that creates the uh, disruption. 
So, well, I guess so. <laughs> so, it, it, in in the sense that when we had so few materials to deal with for a semiconductor device, it, a lot of it could be done in interface with our customers and in interface with our suppliers. We can't do that anymore. Yeah. So there is no single entity in the world that can actually handle the complexity of a 3D transistor anymore with the kind of materials and processes and uh, applications and the cost drivers that we have to deal with. So we have to practice open innovation, we have to work with people mm -hmm. and really go out and you know adopt whatever the best practices are and best inventions are. Okay, very good. Uh, any questions from the audience? We have some uh, runners with uh, mics, if there are any. Well, while you're thinking of questions, uh, I wanted to, um, I wanted to, to also uh, ask, a, ask a question based on some of uh, what was discussed uh, here uh, in your presentations. Uh, uh, Nag, you especially talked about uh, roadmaps, and uh, Moore's Law, of course, being this, this great example of, uh, of, a, uh, of a collective uh, decision, really, yep. to develop technology in a certain way in an industry. Um, and uh, there are certain aspects of the semiconductor industry that maybe make that easier than it is in some other industries. I wanted to ask uh, both Homer and Lorenza uh, for, um, for uh, sort of energy materials and for display technologies. Uh, is, is that concept of road mapping that we see manifest in Moore's Law as, as applicable? Uh, is there the kind of consensus mm -hmm. that has to be there among manufacturers sure. to make it a reality? In, What's been your yeah. experience with that? So in the photovoltaic industry, solar cells and, and, and modules, of course, um, roadmap is extremely important uh, function of our job. And something analogous that we have in photovoltaics is how the dollars per watt manufacturing cost or purchasing price is reducing with time. Mm. Um, for instance, uh, 10 years ago, you had to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to buy a single panel, where now you can buy it at very attractive price, and we believe that prices will continue to go down and become a lot more affordable. Now, uh, it's important to understand what uh, uh, the, 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 the determining uh, powers that push the, uh, the manufacturing cost down, as well as what it takes to install the panels. So we are going now from a mode where we have brought the uh, manufacturing cost of the panels at a very nice level, but we need to work on the installation cost, yeah. Yeah. right? So we need to come up with material solutions that will help us to make the installation a lot easier, for instance, right? Or to come up with materials uh, that will deliver a lot higher power, so we have to use much higher density uh, that convert the electricity a lot more efficiently. So it's, it's important to understand uh, the roadmap. What is the potential of the technology? Right. How high we can go in terms of uh, power output? How low we can go in terms of dollars per meter square? Yeah, right. right. Yeah. So, so in the case of P PV in particular, though, you have quite different technologies on the marketplace simultaneously. That's right. Uh, so presumably there's some, do they have their own roadmaps, or is there enough commonality in, in, in how these, these relationships yes. between efficiency so and cost work that they can? If you recall, uh, we're using the three uh, fundamental pillars in, uh, in photovoltaics, um, the manufacturing cost, the materials cost, the lifetime, yeah. as well as uh, the output. Right? So for each one of these materials, we need to make sure that these parameters, these pillars are satisfied. Right. So if we're talking about pack sheets, uh, or if we're talking about encapsulants, or the cell technology that goes into the, let's talk about crystal and silicon, we have individual roadmaps, indeed. Um, so uh, for the cell itself, uh, the power output is the number one criteria, but also you want to deliver this maximum power output at the lowest possible manufacturing cost. Sure. So all of a sudden now you have two, diver two different roadmaps. Yeah, yeah. You need to reduce the uh, manufacturing uh, steps, which is a challenge for applied. So it's important that we collaborate with our customers, with the uh, equipment suppliers to deliver the best possible so solution mm -hmm. to the customers. And we, we always uh, share with them the roadmap okay. in all these building blocks. Lorenzo, in the case of uh, display technology, well, uh, I think that, uh, uh, and I actually kind of disagree a little bit with, uh, I think that in semiconductor, in silicon semiconductor, the roadmap was a document where 
uh, all companies, all competitors, no, I mean, there were different evolution, but I mean, agree on what was the roadmap and gave to um, to the different part of the uh, of the chain the ability to have a target that was in a sense internal. Uh, the what uh, in this play, and I think in part in photovoltaics, there is not such a ma such a things like a, a solid uh, sure. semiconductor uh, roadmap. Right. Uh, there are general trends that yeah. are a little different. So inside the the company, inside Samsung, and again in that sense uh, that is a privileged position. There are roadmaps, and then uh, the different uh, Samsung, the Samsung chain knows what Samsung. Samsung Electronic does, and Samsung Display knows what Samsung Electronic. So there is a, a roadmap, and everybody try to get to the product in consistent way. But at the level of the industry, I don't think there is right now mm. Uh, mm. in display. And I don't oh, know. Yeah, yeah. I would agree. It's not as unified as it has been in the case of the transistors. How many transistors you can yeah. put yeah. to unit right. area? Right. Uh, the system is a little bit There's more There's a very complex. specific target yeah. there. So yeah. for applied to work uh, in the display is much tougher because they don't really know what uh, uh, the, the roadmap of Samsung is as opposed to uh, the, the roadmap of Sony or somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, if I could add, um, so the way we think about these roadmaps is that the reason semiconductor industry had a very good roadmap to work with there are two of them, like Moore's Law and the ITRS roadmap. The reason Moore's Law was as effective as it is, is everyone in the industry could actually think through and understand it. You don't have to have any semiconductor IC chip design background to understand what the Moore's Law is calling for. So that simplicity was important. Yeah. Second, that Moore's Law worked more as a stick, not as a carrot. So people knew that if they failed <laughs> off of that to, to keep up with that Moore's Law, they lose their shirts, they lose their business. Yeah. Whereas most industry roadmaps tend to make it look like a carrot in the sense that wouldn't it be nice to have this many lumens per watt? Wouldn't it be nice to have this kind of a dust pennies per watt peak power? So the very fact that it's more of a carrot, you know, kind of makes it not so effective <laughs> in our opinion. So, we need a stick instead. We need a stick. <laughs> <laughs> or to put it differently, there are multiple roadmaps. There is not yeah. an agreement of yeah. uh, on a single roadmap. Yeah. Questions from the audience? Yes? So just a comment. Uh, so this issue of carrot versus stick is an interesting one. Uh, but I think the reason why the stick approach worked for the semiconductor industry was because lithography was a driver for performance. Yeah. And you knew how to get from one node to the other on a regular basis. But now everything has changed even for the semiconductor industry. It's no longer lithography. It's materials and structures. Yeah, it's true. And the moment you rely on innovation of new materials for anything, you cannot have a timeline because you cannot innovate on a timeline. <laughs> so now the Good semiconductor point. industry is the yeah. same boat as photovoltaics, same boat as displays, and every other industry yeah. where you're limited by the need for new materials. Mm. Yeah. That's a good point. Good good point. point. Very yeah. good point. I agree. Uh, questions? Yeah, so um, I, I see that you focus the discussion on the semiconductor, um, but I know that there's been a lot of talk out there about optical computers and communication, quantum computers and communications. Um, two questions, is there any intent to do a roadmap to see what are commonalities and what are differences between these industries and um, where do you see yourself um, in, in this uh, overall picture? Tough question, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that. Spike, you have an answer for that? <laughs> oh, sorry. So, um, something about optical computing. <laughs> Quantum computing. <laughs> so sorry. Hey, uh, one hour lecture, so I, I don't think I can give you a two minute answer. Uh, but yes, all other forms of non von Neumann computing I think will be the next generation of computing. And there we are limited by a uh, number of different camps having completely different perspective of right. what the so called cognitive computing might be. Yeah. There's only one camp that I think is trying to imitate what the brain uh, is trying to do in terms of hierarchical interconnect. And there, actually, I want to come back to this uh, maker's uh, 
forum or market, what is the word that was used. Uh, it's interesting because if you look at uh, uh, where we are today from a technology perspective, if you look at interconnect capability in our systems, we are highly constrained by our Manhattan coordinate thought process, right? So if you look at, let's say, we don't have the situation yet, but you would need a structure where you have three-dimensionally distributed devices. We don't know what the device is going to be yet. Some kind of a device or a storage element, but distributed in three dimensions. And if you look at the ability to interconnect them today, you're limited to maybe four or six, depending on how you count, right? But if you look at what the brain does, it's three orders of magnitude higher. You've got to go from four to 4,000. So this notion of this maker's commons or maker's market is something absolutely critical to go from four to 4,000. There are no known techniques to get there today to get to that level of interconnectivity, right? Mm -hmm. So that is at the heart of new sets of technologies. So it's not so much optical. That's still a continuation of existing stuff. You've got to think way beyond optical. You've got to think about non environment technologies where you completely change the paradigm of what the devices and what the interconnect technologies are to get to the next level of computing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any uh, any further responses on on uh, quantum computers and op and other other methods of, of of doing computation? I think that uh, a roadmap uh, emerged. Uh, the need or, or the lack of it uh, emerged when there is uh, there are actually device uh, or device for better use, mm. lack of another word, that are in the market. Yeah. I think that uh, for uh, some of the optical computing and other applications, we are not yet that there. Right. Right. So there is not a roadmap because uh, it's more a, a research. Yeah. Oh. There is, um, that was certainly the origin of Moore's Law, was him just looking yeah. back at yeah. the last few years of what had happened. Exactly. It's an observation. Uh, I had, I had a question uh, about, uh, we're at a university, uh, and as an academic, I'm interested in, in this, and then, uh, so, so a few of my colleagues here, too, uh, might be interested in it, but um, if, if you um, uh, thought about your own career and also openings uh, at your respective companies, uh, is there, is, what, 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 how can we better educate students so that they can uh, be uh, effective and, and ultimately rise to be leaders in materials? related uh, innovations in industry. So maybe I'll start yeah. with, uh, with Homer. Yeah, I mean, one way to do this is to enhance the collaboration between universities and, and companies, uh, big companies and small companies. Large organizations, uh, large corporations have the ability to um, uh, collaborate with institutions like yours a lot easier than smaller companies. Sure. In a startup environment, you move very rapidly, you are laser focused, and you have three years to turn things around. But in a larger organization, because you have this parallel process that I was referring to, it gives the opportunity for educational institutions to tap into these different parallel processes. So we need to work closer with academic institutions and exchange uh, information more openly. Mm. So uh, basically, uh, one of the reasons that we have the institution here is to tap into the talent that comes from the institutions in the area, mm. right? right? So, and we need to work towards um, supporting institutions like DuPont, for instance, is uh, supporting GSEC, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? For multiple reasons, yes. to understand what will be happening, let's say, 10 years from now, uh, as well as seeing the talent that comes from yeah. the university, right? Yeah. As we build our future yes. sources. Thank you for your support of GSEC. Yeah. Uh, not yeah, so we have a very strong, close relationship with uh, CIS, mm -hmm. and so we have quite a few of those graduates that come to apply. Yes. So that's a strong collaboration. Um, so we had um, our solar and the display businesses are relatively new, um, and not as innovation-driven as semiconductors was over the period of a uh, few few years. It's sure. more. Uh, tool and equipment driven. And so we haven't had as close a relationship with any of the centers, and mm -hmm. not just at Stanford, mm -hmm. but any of the university right. centers. So, but that's changing. So we are beginning to evolve mm -hmm. as we look at, you know, the solar industry is in a nuclear winter. So still, <laughs> so, I mean, we are still, for the equipment side, we're still in the darkest part. I mean, it's I think uh, the materials is doing a little bit better and it's uh, coming coming back. A display came back roaring this year. We think uh, it's going to grow, uh, actually. So there's a lot more innovation happening in the display industry. Yeah. 
So especially related to OLED for both display and lighting. Yeah. So there's a lot more innovations okay. happening there. And so we have a lot of interest to collaborate and we mm -hmm. open. So uh, uh, off late, we've been doing a lot of, uh, we, particip we are participating in a lot of hub uh, proposals sure. that the National Labs led. Mm. We are part of uh, other consortia yep. that are developed at both um, in the Northeast as well as uh, on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. So we are collaborating. So we have a lot more interest too. Okay. Yeah. So Lorenzo, what, what can we do at the universities to uh, provide better so, educated students? So, uh, so what you do for, for Samsung, for sure now, I, uh, you provide the student every year, uh, st uh, some, each actually company of Samsung has a recruiting events uh, that are uh, um, mainly directed to Korean students that get educated in U.S. in mm. top institutions sure. like Stanford, but they are not necessarily close to them. Uh, uh, the, the recruiting uh, effort is also for, uh, in a large part, I mean, for everybody. Uh, so that is, uh, I would say, uh, something that is recognized that you already did. Uh, I think that create students that have a solid background is the most important part mm. because the student when he will go in the industry will not be doing the same that he did at the university. Sure. So the two characteristics that are very important is one that the person, the student has learned the basic and then that he has learned to do to do critical thinking mm. in good uh, experimental um, code. <laughs> I think if you can do that, that is a, a matter of success, and that is why you try. I mean, Samsung and other try to uh, to fish in good institutions. Very good. All right. So I think uh, we've, uh, we've reached the uh, end of our time. And uh, let's thank uh, our panelists again, Lorenza, Homer, and Nog, for their uh, insights and uh, for sharing them with us today. Thank you.